meeting to order the Law Enforcement Public Safety Committee. Uh, first order of business is to approve the minutes from the May 3rd meeting. Make a motion. Was I here? I think I was absent. Second. You still can. I did review the minutes. You read the minutes. It's good enough. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Next up, we have a, a presentation by Mr. Chief Charlie King uh, concerning uh, capital service plan. And before Mr. King starts, I'll tell everybody, it's, it, what he's talking about is necessary we, we're, we don't have a whole lot of choice. Chief, you're on. Thank you. <clears throat> Council members, thank you again for, for having us. I, I know this seems like a, a, a Groundhog Day topic that just keeps recurring every time I, I meet one of you as we, we talk about trucks but uh, and our capital equipment. But uh, as Mr. McCall said, it, it's not only important to us uh, because of the, the equipment that, that's required for delivery of service every day, but it, it's important to us because it's one of the largest uh, expenditures annually of our taxpayer dollars across the county is what goes into uh, our fire and emergency services uh, uh, capital plan. So uh, I know we came to you back in February with a, a little bit larger request than we do annually, and you, you obliged us that, and uh, we, we felt it important to come back to you as soon as possible with, with absolute fact. You, you, you made some, some great decisions to support us on uh, some assumptions and some fact, but we, we really have uh, worked hard over the, the last six months with, with Ernie Beck from Motorpool, uh, Mr. Bohorn that's on our fire commission that uh, kind of packaged a lot of the information, reconciled it, and fact-checked a lot of things to be able to come to you with what we feel is, is an absolute solid plan uh, to carry our vehicle replacement schedule into the future. Uh, in saying that, we, we've worked hard to make sure that it's a lean plan, that, that we're not coming to you with a lot of extravagancies. Uh, there, there's not a lot of spare or, or, or extra fluff or apparatus that's sitting around the county. The things that are into this plan uh, are things that are needed. Uh, each and every day and, and removal of even one of them uh, could potentially have an impact on our ISO ratings and, and homeowner ratings, but more importantly, just general service delivery uh, that we have. Uh, th this plan is inclusive of the majority of the rolling stock, 246 vehicles uh, across the county, uh, and including in this plan is SCBAs, the breathing apparatus that the fire departments use. Uh, years ago, those weren't a significant planning item because they uh, weren't that expensive. SCBAs today uh, are well into the $7,000 range per unit, and, and our operation requires 330 of those. Uh, so, so that's a significant uh, expense that we, we wanted to make sure uh, was included in the plan in front of you. But again, I can't stress enough just uh, the, the job that, that Mr. Horn and, and Ernie did to support us in creating the plan. but. Uh, as we flip through it, just know that a fine tooth comb was used and, and included. Uh, the overall expense of this between now and 2043, if, if adopted, uh, includes uh, right at $31 million uh, over that 25 year span. And, and we wanted to make sure that we had it right because that, that is a lot of money to each and every one of us. When we came to you in February, uh, we discussed the, the additional need for, for $750,000 of additional investment over the 340 that typically uh, is allotted annually for fire trucks. When we go through this plan, we really tried to look at some creative and out of the box thinking uh, and, and purchasing ways that, that kind of kept us at that number that we, we talked about with you uh, in February. And we hope you'll see that we really tried to meet that goal uh, in everything we did. So as we go through, just kind of remember uh, those items. So we'll, we'll just kind of flip page to page the the first uh, page that you'll really come across just shows a, an allotment or assignment of vehicles uh, to each one of our stations, fire and rescue, medical response, uh, shows the placement of each one of the vehicles that we uh, have in our fleet. And again, as you see in there, there's not a lot of 
reserve apparatus or, or extra things sitting around. Uh, we depend for reserve, there's not extras, we depend on the 25-year-old apparatus uh, that's recently replaced and taken out of service. And uh, for, for a lot of our vehicles, we depend on Crown Vicks and other vehicles that come out of the sheriff's office uh, should some primary response vehicles uh, go down. So again, that page one just shows you kind of, uh, as you look at the, the stations or communities that you represent, what apparatus is allocated uh, in each one of those. As you go towards the first table, uh, it, it starts to explain uh, each piece of our fleet, each one of the apparatus that we have in the fleet. Uh, on the left-hand column shows the, 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 the year that it would be replaced if we simply went off uh, the anticipated replacement cycle, and that cycle uh, is identified out to the right, but shows the asset name. Uh, then it breaks it down into large, smaller municipal, and we'll talk about the differences in the, each one of those. Large purchases, are typically fire engines and ladder trucks. Small vehicles would be staff vehicles, uh, medical response vehicles, boats, et cetera. And then there's a column for municipal fire apparatus. Uh, our commission and staff agreed that it was important to separate and identify uh, what is currently assigned to the municipalities for consideration of reinvestment into those or consideration if it's included in their contract. Uh, things that uh, yet to be clarified. As you move across, it shows total amounts for, for that replacement year if it was simply based off age, model year of the truck, the mileage of it, and the anticipated replacement cycle. Uh, and then simply out to the sides are just simply my notes of, of things that, that we've made. Uh, trying to go through my notes, make sure I covered everything here. But, but as we work through it, things when, when we've talked before, uh, the plans, if you were to have an old plan that we presented to you in the past, uh, we, we want to be upfront and honest that previous plans that we've shared have been in the $22 uh, million range. This current plan that's in front of you is right at $30 million. And most of that was from us being able to compile and reconcile the absolute fleet in total and account for uh, both increases in the purchase cost and the inclusion of our breathing apparatus uh, in that, which uh, we'll, we'll discuss uh, here in just a little bit. But if you flip through that table to the very last page of it, uh, again, I'm not to bore you with the middle sections, but as you go to the last page of it, uh, there is an explanation at the bottom, and it gives a breakdown of some of the information that's in there. Uh, it shows five-year blocks, anticipated purchases and cost expected uh, in each of the five years throughout the next 25 years. Uh, it talks about replacement cycles, total changes, uh, and, and then the, the annual total of just over $30 million in investment in that 25-year period. Uh, and then again, over the right side, explains some of those changes uh, and why they're at the point that they are today. Moving on into it, we go into to a, a schedule that talks about the, the purchase of it and the notes for, for a new cash flow smoothing schedule. Obviously, when, when uh, we, we discuss with, with the folks that are on our team, we, we encourage them that when they come to us with a problem to, to be able to present us some options or be able to present us a plan and moving forward. So, so one of the things that, that we want to be able to, to propose to you or, or start the conversation moving forward is how, how do we best invest and how do we plan for uh, the investment that's uh, needed into the apparatus. So, so as you start uh, going through the next table, it, it, the numbers are really confusing in it, but what we've attempted to do is when we approached you back in February for that additional uh, $750,000 was to be able to find a way to, to make that dollar amount work uh, into the future. So when you look through this table, you'll see that each piece of apparatus is identified and that as you move through it, it takes those pieces of apparatus and some of them may be slid a year early and some of those may be pushed a year back to, to keep that $1.2 million as close as we can annually uh, into the cost of, of purchase. Uh, and again, if you look, the numbers that are highlighted in yellow, uh, those numbers are, are pushed back a year. 
Uh, the numbers that are highlighted in blue, those are ones that's pushed ahead a year of its recommended purchase uh, simply based on age. And, and the uh, top very line across, uh, the, that's actually the, the purchase, anticipated purchase price year to year. And then the left-hand column works down the, the individual apparatus. And, and obviously you have the year breakdown throughout. One of the pieces to note is the, the blue area where you see highlighted uh, and again, you have to add three, three zeros behind each one of those numbers, it is uh, the proposal of a lease option or a financing option. Uh, in the year 2000, the county invested in 10 new fire engines and 10 tankers at a pretty incredible cost. And, and when looking at this plan and trying to develop something that's uh, both feasible, manageable, and realistic for, for us to plan for, that, that 20 apparatus bought in one year is a hard one to overcome and, and, and make right uh, by, by equitable spending each year. So the proposal in talking to uh, finance folks and truck dealers is the option uh, to, to do two times is to finance those trucks and uh, the financing possibly identified there would, would allow a 16 year loan on those trucks to keep them at our 1.2 million investment annually. If not, there are a handful of years through that that actually takes those over the $4 million mark in total for a couple of those years if you don't spread it out over uh, that time period. And again, this is simply an option and, and a conversation kickoff for us uh, as we move forward with, with the, the implementation of some type of replacement plan. The other significant expense that wasn't included when we discussed uh, back in September was our, our breathing apparatus. Uh, 330 units, breathing air units across the county that are desperately uh, needed uh, on a 15-year replacement cycle. The, the total expense for those is $1.8 million. And, and what's there included in this cycle to keep it at the same budget and, and uh, the plan for those was simply buying half of them on, on June 30th in one budget year and buying the second half on July 1st in the adjacent budget year. Part of the discussion that's led up to this was, well, why can't we buy them through, throughout the year? Why can't, when we buy a new fire engine, we put breathing apparatus on it? And, and that's a very good question, and, and it's uh, not an easy one to answer, but when we, we discuss it with our chiefs across the county and with our, our volunteer team members, the, the breathing apparatus is one of the most critical safety uh, components that they have to do their job with. And if we were to go to buying those uh, each year to, to spread out that load of investment, uh, we potentially could end up with, with many different vendors, many different types of SCBAs, uh, which, which lead to training, maintenance, and, and compatibility issues on a fire scene. In 2010, the county made the investment to replace all of our breathing apparatus because that was the situation that we had prior to that point. Uh, and, and today, that if uh, uh, we, I'm out in the county and, and run a fire with any station or, or a volunteers on the opposite side of the county and does the same, when they go to that fire truck, it, it's one style breathing apparatus that they're able to don and work, or if they were to have an emergency inside of a building, that they absolutely are trained in, in one device to be able to make it work. So again, uh, the majority of that conversation deals with, with operational efficiency. Uh, within our team. But again, as, as you go through the plan, you'll see just it is a proposal for, for options and uh, in, in building the, the conversation as we move forward uh, in, in how we invest. And, and uh, Mr. McCall mentioned it. it. It's a lot of money and we take that seriously. Uh, the, the next couple of pages is it, that's in there, uh, we, we took to, to heart the conversation that we had with you a little over a, a year ago. It was in September of last year when, when we talked about the, the availability and the use of used vehicles in our fleet. And, and we stood uh, behind back last September that we, we make the best use to, of used vehicles as we can, but, but we still run into where frontline fire engines and, and, and rescue vehicles, we, we still want to be able to put absolutely top quality uh, rolling stock in, into our staff and team members' hands to be able to perform their job. But, but behind those in the next couple of pages is just a couple of demonstrations that over the last year uh, we've been able to purchase and, or, or just obtain 
uh, 12 vehicles uh, at, at very low cost to the county. That first picture uh, shows four SUVs. Expedition on the left was bought from a fire department up north. Uh, three Tahoe or the two Tahoes in the middle uh, came from federal surplus at a cost of $9,000 a piece. And the Tahoe on the right came from another county department here that no longer had a use for it. Uh, all four of those vehicles were bought and placed in service in the county at the uh, cost of less than what one new one uh, would be. There's a picture of a boat, a center console boat, that's used for uh, emergency medical and fire delivery on the lake. Uh, that was obtained from a, a, a county department that no longer had a use. Uh, local work was put into it, and that boat's been in service and been a great asset to us. You might recognize the bookmobile with red lights all over it now. Uh, the bookmobile that was replaced last year, it still remains in service in the county as a <coughs> rehab vehicle. Uh, the bookshelves and all inside were converted into benches. That, that vehicle had a large generator and heating and air conditioning unit on it that we're able to take out. Uh, to scenes either for families in fires or for, for the, the team members, the responders on site, to be able to get into to cool off or to get warm uh, on those extreme weather days. And again, there's just a couple of more examples of vehicles uh, that have been either bought, used from departments or, or through federal surplus and, and made good use of in the county, hopefully to demonstrate that, that trying to be good stewards of money and, and, and make the most of it where we can. But, Again, I, I'm open for any questions or uh, myself or Bo Horn. Most of you know Bo. He's available and really a mastermind by, behind the, the why and how uh, on some of the, the smoothing of the purchases out over several years to make it uh, feasible and, and allowable by, by our current standings. i got a question for you. Who writes your grants? We, the individual stations uh, currently write a, uh, as best they can. Uh, Mr. Ritter is helping us with the countywide regional grant. Uh, we're applying for a, a radio system upgrade again this year. We applied for one last year uh, and didn't, didn't receive it. They turned down all the regional grants in the state, but we've reapplied for it. There was a half million dollar fire truck awarded in the county last year uh, in Cornish Shiloh, so it's uh, there are stations receiving grants, but the majority of them uh, have chose to write them themselves. She's met with the Chiefs Association and offered her services to, to be able to help and, and unsure how many have took her up on it, but uh, well aware her services are available to them. Well, that one truck for a half a million bucks last year, there's a possibility we could do that every year if we had somebody writing that grant. Absolutely. So uh, I would suggest that you get with Ms. DeRutter and have her to school those people on writing those grants. She, she has. She, she's attended chiefs meetings and, and met with the chiefs about her availability and what she's capable of. Well, as far as these breathing apparatus, if you put in a grant for any of those? We, we haven't. We, I know I've answered some, some questions that others have had. We, we haven't began to apply for them yet. The, the typical lifespan of, of an SCBA or breathing apparatus is 15 years. Uh, ours are, are at the seven-year mark halfway through their lifespan, so we really would be wasting the effort to write a grant today because they're still essentially new. If we wait another three years, I think, is the time frame to begin applying for grants, and, and that still gives us a four-year period to, to continue to, to reapply for grants. I just, again, I, I know in the way that grant cycle works uh, in the age of those units that they're a, a low priority score when they're submitted so it'd kind of be a waste of her effort uh, if not waiting another three years to begin the grants for those units okay. are we ahead on the vehicle replacement plan when you look at the vehicle replacement plan the the first one that just shows the the listing of vehicles in the years it, it appears that right now that we're caught up with it but again, we're staring those 20 apparatus in, that, that are deemed to be replaced in 2020 in the face. So uh, the, again, the plan allows us to move some forward, push a few of them back. But again, when you look at it on paper today, we're buying the apparatus that's appropriate to its, its cycle, but that, that doesn't account for those 20 trucks that are facing us down in just a couple of years. Right. That was one of the four warnings that we made up here during the budget season on the smash can in the road 
It's no longer a kick can in the road. Um, there was some recommendation for additional millage to get us moving forward that was declined that we are facing uh, in front of us. And, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. But so I just, I know that that's coming down the road and it's coming quickly. Um, and we're still not addressing that need um, as exactly what Mr. McCall said, we have to do this. It's not a choice. Um, and I think one of the things that I want to touch on, we, we constantly hear that this county doesn't do anything for those rural areas out there. And we're very blessed in Oconee County to have the outreach that we have with our fire stations. And people have no idea what it truly does for their home insurance ratings. Uh, I mean, I think we're at 97, 97 yes, percent. Right under 98 percent. Yeah, coverage. so we're right under 98 percent where most surrounding counties are in the 60s yes. and 70 percent. So, you know, I want to remind people in those outside areas that this county is doing a lot of great things. And the, one of the most important things out there is what y'all do uh, in, in the time of need. And, I, you know, y'all do a phenomenal job and the volunteers do a great job. And I do want to state that this council has done a very, very good job at rewarding, you know, what y'all do on there. And I, I, I really do appreciate that. But I do see those that big number staring us and somebody's going to have to face it. Yes. Sir. And, and as we, we talked it and again, try to demonstrate that the, the cycle or the proposal in front of you is absolutely as, as lean as we can make it. Uh, to, today we, we operate a Navy of seven boats, uh, not including the swift water, swift water rescue equipment that's out there. This doesn't account for the dive rescue equipment that's out there. It doesn't, uh, account for the a lot of the ancillary specialties that we provide. We have a handful of ATVs and Kubotas uh, that allow us to work in the remote areas. This plan doesn't include any of that stuff because again, it, it was just, we're, we're trying to make this as lean. We still need that equipment to deliver the level of service that we do today. But what we've identified in this plan is what's critical to us to move forward. Can you explain for those that that attack a lot of us council set up here why we have to replace shiny fire trucks sure uh, we, we replace shiny fire trucks because the, the the team members are proud of them and they take good care of them and they're shiny at the end of their 20 or 30 year lifespan uh, the reason we choose to do them at, at a uh, and again frontline engines and and rescue medical vehicles are on a 20 year lifespan uh, the national standard NFPA recommendation is a 15 year. So we're pushing it out five years longer than the national standard. And, and we've identified, we were honest and upfront that the mileage that's in, in those it varies. Uh, the, the busier departments around the municipalities, they, they put a lot of miles on their trucks, while some of the far reaching ones ha have some, some pretty extreme low miles. But again, it's the age of those trucks, the maintenance of those trucks uh, are the reasons that uh, it's time to replace them because when when, when a, a member or any one of our citizens or visitors call 911, we we can't hope the truck cranks or, or that it's in good working order. We they they demand that the the trucks are in that condition. Thank you. I side with you on that. I just want to. I always like for that good, to be a question. <laughs> one thing, Mr. King and I have talked about is is taxing all the people of the county unfairly as these. Developers come in, they build a build a subdivision, and then the next thing you know, Mr. King, Chief King, gets hit with, well, we got, they need a fire truck there, and we've talked. He and I talked today, and I talked with the county attorney today. These developers or these people are going to, have to pay an impact fee, so they're they're coming in here. The developer comes in, builds a big subdivision, hauls freight with the money. And the, the, all the taxpayers are saddled with the bill, and it's only fair that we the, the new subdivision that requires all this extra stuff has to pay the developer of the subdivision or the people in there have to pay the the, the cost for their protection. Because if not, they they it's cheap land come in they build they build a big thing haul freight with the money. Mr. Chief King is saddled with protecting it. It's his obligation. 
unfortunately, then it comes out to the county of another station, another six or eight air packs, however many they need for a station, I don't know. And it's more burden on all the taxpayers. And after, after a while, this, this scenario is the tail wagging the dog. And Chief King has done this presentation. He's done absolutely the best he can. Uh, Mr. Horn has spent countless hours putting all these numbers together. And because of ISO, they say you can't have a truck for so long and you got to get rid of it. They don't give a darn how, how new it is. You got to get rid of it because they say it's too old. So we're caught in the middle. And I appreciate your, your, your work, Mr. King. Well, Mr. McCall, these subdivisions pay taxes too. If a subdivision comes in and this well, got 100 houses, I mean, that's 100 houses that go on the tax thing. So, but when you, when you look at the actual footprint of new subdivisions, the houses are, are closer together. It's a smaller footprint, which actually puts your call volume in a closer area. Um, so, you know, I think that's an unfair assessment because, I mean, we, we sit here and talk about that we don't have enough housing in the area, but when they come in, we want to impact fee a subdivision. You know, to me, they pay taxes. They pay plenty of taxes. Every homeowner in there pays taxes. Yeah, but the, they, they develop these things, and then the developer's gone, and then they come to us. You got it. We got some going into the lower part of the county now. They go come to us. Well, you got. We got to have a fire truck. So their whole taxes in the subdivision for 20 years ain't gonna pay. Ain't gonna make half the payment of the fire truck. Somebody had. Somebody is gonna have to come up with it. Why should we settle? Saddle the people of Mountain Rest, Wall Hollow, Fair Play, all over the county for somebody else's good fortune. Yeah, developer, developer, making it, make it a big, big splash. He's gone, and For all those... these people are expecting all this fire protection stuff. They ought to be told up front. Hey, look here, you come in here, you're going to do this. Then you're going, you're going to have to, if you want services, services cost money. But those thirty-five to forty-five million dollar investments, that's 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 not enough taxes. Four 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 percent. Plus, plus homestead exemption? Run Most of those aren't 4%. Those big, rich houses are. Big houses, any house, 4%. All residential is probably 4%. Rental property is 6%. Industrial property is 10.5%. Residential can enjoy a, a, a homestead exemption. We'll have to agree to disagree on the impact fees. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, EMS update, Greenville Hospital System Director. Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Dix. I'm the administrator for Greenville Health System's uh, EMS program, which includes uh, a county and mobile care ambulance service. So um, over the last six months, we've um, had some changes in both uh, leadership, and we've added a bunch of resources to the um, to the county. So um, the I guess the newest thing is me. Um, so I've, I've been with the hospital system for about five years. I've been here with the county for about uh, the last four or five months. Um, Dr. Thomas Blackwell is our primary medical director and chief of the division of pre-hospital medicine, which kind of oversees the the whole EMS. Uh, field, we've added a new medical director, and then over the past uh, several months, we've added a 12-hour truck to the Kiwi Key area. We have a quick response vehicle with a supervisor in it, so there's an additional um, experienced paramedic that's able to respond to calls. Uh, we've, uh, you probably have seen it. There's a brand new ambulance that's been added to the road. Uh, that's about a $225,000 um, investment, mm -hmm. and we have about $200,000 worth of um, biomedical technology that's being added to our uh, top of the line or our, our front line uh, EMS trucks. And um, you know, we're still in conversations with um, Chief King and with um, the group, the uh, GHS leadership group at Oconee Memorial, to kind of see where the next steps are with um, kind of deploying our assets, but. This was just a way of 
introductions, just saying hi, and uh, seeing if you guys had any questions that we can answer for you. How many amulets do y'all have? Are you asking for Oconee or GHS? No, 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 for Oconee. Okay. So there's five ambulances, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's a sixth truck, which is at Kiwi Key right now, seven days a week, 12 hours a day. And then we have two other ambulances stationed during the day uh, to handle uh, some of the discharge volume out of the hospital and to provide what we call um, our priority two calls. So our, you know, you see an ambulance going lights and sirens. We always make sure there's a paramedic going to that. But sometimes we get requests for lower acuity items, uh, headaches, cut fingers, so on and so forth. So uh, we can send a BLS truck to that, a basic life support truck, and keep that ALS truck available. So. That's our minimum staffing for a county. Uh, one of the benefits that we that um, combining uh, with GHS is that anytime there's a uh, an increase in volume, we're able to flex um, trucks from the Pickens and Greenville area, and vice versa. So, and any time during the during the day, we have about 20 staffed ambulances. So, um, for instance, when we had to evacuate the coast. Uh, we were able to flex upwards of nine ambulances staffed with paramedics and EMTs to go down to the coast and, and help with evacuation. So, God forbid, there's a large-scale incident, we're able to flex a lot of a, a lot of apparatus instead of just being just a Coney. We're now looking at a, a much larger EMS system. Well, first off, welcome to No Coney. So appreciate. It. I'm glad to have you. Is there a cost estimate of what it would take? for the, the Salem area to go to that 24 hour from the 12 to 24? So yes, there is there is a cost. Uh, but before we even, and this, I'm, I'm not a politician, just so you know. I, I mean, it's, it's, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm I a paramedic accuse, I didn't trade. accuse you of being yeah. one. Well, I just wanted to let you know, I'll answer your question, but first and foremost. I know which, there's a cost right. with it, but I'm saying, do you know what the cost is? Yeah, I do, be? but really quickly, and why it becomes kind of difficult is because you can't just station an ambulance in a parking lot. This is one of the issues that we've been having as we've been discussing about where we can put an ambulance because there's there's no building that can support 24-hour housing of an ambulance. So before, we, just that has to be thought of before we even talk. But uh, the general cost of an ambulance uh, one year is about $330,000 in personnel. Uh, the capital investment, it's about $225,000 for the physical ambulance and probably another $100,000 in biomedical technology that has to go into the truck. The cardiac monitors, the stretcher, the radio systems, there's a lot of infrastructure that gets built. But, um, you know, there, there's a, so we provide about a $4 million EMS system um, for the, the subsidy that's currently provided from the county. So the rest of that financial support is provided by Greenville Health System and Oconee Memorial. We've had some questions to why it's not 24 hours, and I appreciate you stating that because there is some a lot more that needs to go into it to yeah. create the 24 hours. So hour. what we try to do is uh, with EMS is uh, because EMS is relatively new, it was never really built to the tax systems. I mean, EMS only came around in the 80s. <laughs> So it's very difficult for communities to try to figure out how to pay for services. And there's only about a 50 to 60% collection on EMS billing. So there's a huge deficit. Uh, the reason why we say that is because you have to become really efficient. So you have to figure out where the call volume is. So <coughs> we have to figure out a way of being able to respond efficiently to those more rural areas while also appreciating the call volume is much lower. So that becomes complex as we start pulling the trucks out. But as a perfect example, the reason why we still have three trucks stationed in Seneca is not only the call volume, but we would love to pull that truck south. We just don't have a building to put it in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chief Kenning and I have been discussing about possible options of where to put that ambulance. So there's a lot of complexities involved, not just the staffing model. We gotta know where to put the truck. And then anytime you add resources, what you wanna do is you also wanna balance as one truck deploys, where and how can you kind of how can you move your assets to cover more territory? And that's something that we're looking at right now. So as the northern trucks start to deploy out for calls, can we start sliding trucks more north to kind of cut down some of the response times? Do 
You good? Yeah. Okay. Pleasure meeting you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. And next up, we're going to have we were going to have a, a presentation of Ms. Cammy, but due to certain legal things, which I will turn over to the county attorney, and he will explain. And then we're going to have another meeting before the council meeting uh, this coming Tuesday. Uh, Mr. Attorney, explain what I'm trying to say. Yes, Mr. Council, or Chair, Committee Chair, my call. Um, with Ms. Kamick's participation, we had a concern that that would potentially convert this into a full council meeting, which wouldn't have been properly noticed. So just out of an abundance of caution, we wanted to make sure that it was properly noticed. So it's my understanding that at 5 o'clock on this coming Tuesday, a week from now, We'll have another law enforcement public safety meeting to address the solid waste ordinance and the animal control ordinance in some depth. Noticed at the same time as a concurrent notice will be a special council meeting, so all the council members could be here and participate to the degree that they felt appropriate. Uh, and then we wouldn't risk violating any public meeting record or FOIA requirements. Um, along the same lines, I, I know generally we do not have public comment during um, the discussion items for committees, but as we discussed before, you wanted to have the folks who showed up today uh, give them a, an opportunity to talk. So I think you wanted to note for solid waste, I guess after Mr. Steele's presentation and as well as for animal control, to allow the folks in attendance who wanted to speak a few minutes each um, as you deemed appropriate. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Uh, let's see. We got. How many people, raise your hands, you're here for animal. We had, you had two more, where'd they go? They bailed on you? Okay, all right. We'll let Mr. Still go first, and uh, then you'll be back again on Tuesday. Appreciate you coming. We're going to need a 24-hour place to sleep here if we keep all these meetings up. Good afternoon. Um, there we go. Um, we just wanted to, uh, there's been several questions that's been brought up uh, concerning the ordinance, and uh, we wanted to kind of give a little bit of history of where we were going uh, Talk to talk about it. I talked with Mr. Martin and Mr. Root concerning this here, and we felt maybe some good idea just to bring you up to speed on why what we did. Um, our county, our solid waste mission has always been to uh, develop and implement programs and services which protect natural resources, um, reduce waste, facilitate recycling, and minimize the impacts as much as possible to the environment. Um, and we try to do that with all of our facilities. And um, the next slide here, you'll see. Um, we have a bunch of facilities. Um, we have 11 man recycle centers. We have an active class two, which is a, uh, see our C&D landfill down in Seneca. Our transfer station, our MRF, our material recovery uh, facility where all of our recyclables come to and we prepare for shipment. Uh, we also have the asphalt concrete recycling facility there at the landfill now, um, right beside the mulching facility. And we maintain two of, um, closed class three landfills and we've also got our school and commercial recycling program that we've been operating for the last two and a half years which is uh, starting to grow by leaps and bounds um, on slide four uh, next slide right here uh, most of y'all probably y'all remember these things I reckon uh, prior to 1991 this is what you had for uh, getting rid of your waste uh, we went to a school a few weeks ago, and we actually mentioned it at a Rotary Club meeting also. Uh, kids that are graduating from high school today have never seen these on all side of roads in Oconee County. Because uh, in 2001 was the last group up around the Long Creek area that they were removed. And they were removed because simply they were dirty, unsafe. I mean, wild animals anywhere from uh, uh, rat snakes, raccoons, to bears were uh, up in those containers. Uh, as well as it offered no recycling, and there was very few solid waste regulations at that time. Um, in 1991 is when they 
South Carolina developed the uh, Solid Waste Management Act and started requiring folks to recycle. Next slide. Why were they constructed? Um, the centers were designed that uh, the, pop the population could drive uh, roughly within five miles to dispose of their waste. That can, uh, about 80% of the population today is about 83%. Uh, you've got places down in lower part of the county uh, around Fair Play. They drive anywhere from seven to eight miles to get to the closest center. Up to the far uh, northeast um, portion of the county where they might drive 15, 16 miles depending on how close to the North Carolina line they're living. Um, the recycle centers are safe. They offer recycling. They help uh, they prevent open dumping and unsanitary conditions. Our staff are there to help people uh, know where to put their materials and to keep people, uh, people from dumping things just right out on the ground when the containers get full. Um, on the next slide, you notice is our 11 recycle centers. Uh, we average about 1.8 million cars per year through our centers. Uh, that's a, a good number of people uh, coming back every week. We see the same people over and over and over again uh, from people who come once a day with one bag of garbage to people who come once a month with a couple hundred bags of garbage, it seems like. Uh, the resident visitors can dispose at no extra charge. There's no charge for them to come in. Uh, we, we've never went to a uh, uh, sticker like some counties have. I think Pickens County, if, you, if you're a resident, you have a sticker that shows you can come into their recycle centers. And if you don't have a sticker, you can't enter their recycle uh, into the centers. But uh, our department's always been under the belief we've got people from all over that come in, uh, people who are vacationing, people who are just passing by. We'd rather them stop in, throw the dark trash away, and then throwing it out on the side of the road. So uh, we've never went to a, a sticker-type system. On the next slide, um, this is things we recycle. We've had a couple questions over the last few weeks, too, um, about what we do at the centers, what we can take, what we can't take. Um, we, as far as disposal goes, all the centers take household trash. And at Strawberry Farm, we uh, take mattresses. And that's the only center we take mattresses at. Um, and we try to keep those out in the landfill just because of some issues we were having with regulatory wise. Um, we're recycling, we still recycle cardboard, plastic, aluminum cans, paper products, glass, scrap metal, motor, cooking oil, um, batteries, both uh, rechargeable and car automotive batteries, um, marine batteries. Uh, we also do glasses and hearing aids for, uh, uh, for the Lions Club. Uh, as far as we've had some, and we also do tires. Um, glass is also uh, mentioned. Um, a lot of counties are no longer taking glass. We're still able to take glass. I think last year we recycled close to uh, between 350 to 400 tons of glass, um, all, all colors and mixed, um, and we're still able to get rid of that. I think we brought in close to uh, $3,500 off that glass. Um, next slide. Um, issues that were addressed in the ordinance that uh, had come about that we were looking at, um, we've had some unloading of trash from vehicles. Uh, and. We've, um, over the past few years, we've had an uh, uptick in seeing the amount of needles coming through trash. Um, you reach down, pick up a bag, um, it's a good chance that you're going to get. We've had uh, several employees over the last 10 years that have had needle sticks, and that is not something um, fun. Uh, then they have to go through a course of a 12 month of testing. Um, and so uh, we did a, uh, survey of most of the counties we got a response from about 30 counties and it's split 50 50 whether or not you help help the elderly help the handicapped um, it all depends on uh, what they've done uh, just to give you a couple examples needle sticks even theft um, uh, clerks have been accused of stealing stuff out of their vehicles to even to the point of uh, i think greenville county responded we've painted two vehicles now so we no longer help unload trash um, the second thing, residents using county equipment, uh, there's a couple uh, items there. We've had people come up, they want to grab the water hoses, starting to wash the back of the vehicles out. Uh, and not only there, but also at the, at the landfill, they want to come up, tie off to equipment, and yank things out of the back of their trucks. And we just don't want our, any of our equipment tore up, messed up, or, or cause problems to their vehicle. Um, and then one of the next ones there, residents not exiting prior to closing time. Uh, our hours are posted 7 to 7 at the... The recycle centers and many would come in at seven o'clock wanted to come on in um, and by the time they got un through unloading or putting their recycles out it was 7 15 or so uh, we wanted to make sure it was noted that they have to exit by seven o'clock it's not open till seven it's open so they can get out by seven next slide 
Uh, business using the centers versus transfer station, where uh, it's supposed to, all businesses are supposed to come to the transfer station or have their own uh, trash service. Um, and so we're making sure they're aware it is for residential use only. Uh, large vehicles with trailers, uh, it's at the, uh, there's a portion that where we have people coming in with large trailers. It, uh, at Strawberry Farm, it's not really a problem because you get the big loop there. But we've seen, um, personally seen at Salem and a couple other people pull in with a uh, F-350 uh, dually with a 16-foot uh, horse trailer on the back trying to unload garbage. And once they pull in a gate, it's, it may take them 15 minutes to get backed up, turned around, and they block traffic and traffic's out in the road. Um, so we're, we're trying to limit the size of the trailer so if somebody pulls in there, they're not causing a, a, profit, a problem to other residents. And then residents bring large loads. We have a lot of people who want, or they claim they're doing clean outs. They're either <coughs> doing clean outs or their or their business trying to get by with it. Um, but they come in, they may have anywhere, like I said, up to from anywhere from 50 to 100 bags of garbage at a time. Um, they, they they take they they park, and then other residents can't get around them, or they 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 string if they have it sitting there for if you. You got 100 to 200 bags, you're going to have a lot that's strung across the parking lot. And by the time they get everything cleaned up um, and moved out the way, they can cause, cause some issues there. All right, next slide. A little history from where, we, where we're coming on the rest of this uh, apartment. And from 1974 to 1991, we, um, we operated a MSW landfill at Five Forks and also there on Wells Highway uh, where we disposed of and c &D waste was disposed in those. Um, with no diversion and no uh, separation. In 1991, with the first recycle center opened there on Strawberry Farm, and from 91 to 2001, the rest of the centers were um, slowly opened as they took off the roadside litter there. Um, 95 and 96, they, the, the landfill was, uh, five floors closed and the MRF was open. Um, and then, on the go, next slide. Uh, in 96, the Solid Waste Commission and County Council decided to build a transfer station and um, disposal of waste management and closed uh, the MSW landfill there to um, Class 3 and opened up a uh, Class 2 landfill, which is the CND that we operate now. In 98, the transfer station opened, the Class 3 closes, and the, CND, the first CND opened there uh, that was close to Strawberry Farm Road. In 2002, they started permitting the next CND sale, um, and in 2006, 2007, the Class 2 expansion was constructed. Um, 2008, we started filling the new expansion area and purchased larger wood grinder to increase capabilities from, we had a grinder that could only do a six inch limb and there was very, there was a lot of wood going into the landfill causing it to fill up very quickly. Um, our new grinder can do up to a 24 inch log. Anything larger than that, we actually, um, we load up and haul down to a wood yard. Um, in 2012, uh, we also started the asphalt recycling from work done by the county road department we started one there at the camp and also one at the landfill. Um, in 2014, council states we want to reach a goal, a recycling rate of 85%. So we started picking up some other things that we were, uh, were not doing at the time. In 2015, I started separating concrete block and brick along with asphalt at landfill with no fees for contractors as long as they separated and brought it in uh, free and clear. And 2017, the Class II landfill issues a notice to residents and commercial customers to separate cardboard and scrap metal from their loads going into the landfill. Uh, we, we highly encouraged it. Uh, we talked with them. Uh, in the first year, we took out roughly 20 ton of cardboard and scrap metal out of the landfill. Uh, however, many residents, they come in, they would still dump. If they, if they had it all mixed in, they didn't want to take the time to separate it. Um, they would just throw everything into the landfill. Um, in 2018, we did a we had a survey done earlier this year. It shows we only have seven years of life in our current sale, um, and our ordinance passed with penalties for customers who did not separate recyclables from the loads, um, and also for residents to start paying at the landfill to try to encourage them because many residents would show up and just they want to just dump everything. It's quicker, it's faster, uh, and it's less hassle. Um, but all items recycled would be at no charge, including brush um, that for even for contractors. Um, going to this slide right here, this uh, our class two landfill uh, last year in physical year 18, uh, we, we disposed of 23,000 tons of debris, um, but did not include the 20 tons of cardboard um, that was recycled out with the scrap metal. 
Uh, we mulched over 9,900 uh, tons of brush, which that was up about 3,000 tons due to Hurricane Irma. Um, we also recycled 3,800 tons of field dirt, which in our recycling, we can actually, uh, instead of for them just coming out dumping it or having it mixed in with something else, they actually bring it in for our soil stockpile that we use to cover the landfill, which actually reduces our landfill cost to a point because we don't, we're not having to go and haul our dirt. We're there dumping it out on the landfill. We stockpile it and use it each third, every month to cover with. Uh, we also recycled um, right at 6,000 tons of asphalt, brick, and block uh, and concrete um, that people had brought in. And we ground a good bit portion of that and used that on our roads instead of having to use rock from the quarry and, um, and go from there. Uh, waste, that come, waste comes from businesses, residents, and also out of county. We get a lot of out of county waste from, uh, from Pickens County. For the most part, Clemson is a whole lot easier to bring it. Uh, Clemson residents, Pendleton residents can bring it to us um, a whole lot faster than driving over to their landfill in, um, over in Pickens. Give you a little bit of what, landfill dynamics. The cost, um, we get a lot of people, uh, they call and say, well, we've paid for this in our taxes, uh, and we, we even get it from commercial customers. Uh, but there's two types of costs that we deal with in a landfill. There's a construction cost and a field cost. Um, our the cost to construct is covered by taxes, and it's a calculated figure because DHA's got rules and regulations that we have to abide by. We have to certain setbacks to streams, houses, um, neighborhoods, churches. Also, how far we can go, we can only go so far above groundwater. Um, so we can, we know our depth, we know our width, and, and then we know how high we can go off above grade, depending upon um, our, the length and width of the, the landfill. So once we put that, get that constructed by the engineer, we put it out for bid, we, we have a fixed cost, that can, that's the easy cost. The, the cost of fill is determined by the type of waste you're taking in. Um, if it's, it's kind of like, is it, is it dense versus is it light? Uh, light lighter stuff is, can be bulky. It's like uh, what takes up more space, a, a ton of cotton or a ton of, of lead. I mean, you got what you're putting into the landfill. Also, it's determined by uh, how it's compacted in the airspace and also the length of life of the landfill depends on how much you're actually allowing to go in there. A little example we, we gave there, say if you got a 20 acre foot, where uh, acre foot is just uh, one acre, one foot deep, um, if you can put 25,000 tons uh, in an acre foot and compact it, um, but you only have 100 acre foot of space, that means you've got roughly five years of life. Well, our average li um, one year of life, according to our permit and things, is roughly around $750,000 for a one year of life at the landfill. Um, the landfill can, if you can pull out 5,000 tons each year, I mean, over a course of a six year period, you saved a year of life, you saved $750,000 and it prevents you uh, a little bit longer to um, actually have to start constructing a new landfill, which is the permitting process is long and tedious. We are now in the process of constructing or uh, permitting the entire site uh, there on Wells Highway to be a um, CND landfill on top of the old MSW landfill. We have been at this now for, I think, going on two years, Mr. Martin, I believe it is. And we have just passed a public hearing, and we have not even made it into the construction, I mean, the, even to the uh, um, design phase of it. The head hasn't given us the to go. Um, the typical length of time is anywhere from five to seven years now to get a permit for a landfill in the state of South Carolina. Next slide. Issues addressed in ordinance, same thing. Patrons not exiting prior to closing time. Patrons leaving unacceptable ways. Disposing of contaminated loads. Uh, patrons disposing of mixed loads. Uh, the difference between unacceptable waste is any waste not listed in Appendix 1 of uh, the DHEC regulations, um, and that could be things like household waste um, and brown goods um, and some white goods and things. Uh, patrons disposal of contaminated load would be having, you would have con construction waste, but you also had household trash mixed in with it. And we get a, a lot of that. Um, we, we have to bring that over to the transfer station. They have to unload it there. It's, it costs the county more. Uh, we actually make a little bit more, but it costs us more because we're having to send it out. The biggest problem that we faced is uh, a lot of times in the transfer station, though, and I'll, I'll cover that in, in a couple slides, too. If they have large loads of concrete in, in mixed in with household garbage, and they dump that on the transfer station floor, it damages the floor and also can damage our compactor in the transfer station. So we, um, we've got um, legislation on that, too. Uh, business passing waste off is from a residence uh, and all customers paying. One of the things we were looking at um, due to trying to get more people to recycle and also 
we have a lot of uh, repeat customers, and I'll um, I'll show you on the, I think in the next slide coming up uh, of what we mean by a lot of businesses coming in, and then all recyclables that are brought to the landfill, brush and concrete, cardboard, scrap metal would be deposited free. Next slide. Here's a breakdown of last year's numbers of people coming into the landfill. Um, the dark blue there are what what are our customers who are already paying, either contractors or commercial entities. Um, you'll notice there, C and D paying their 7,000 customers. They bring in 16,000 ton, um, and the average uh, ton is about two tons per person, and their average cost is about $63 a ton. We have over 16,000 um, residents. This is uh, this does not have any of the um, uh, municipalities numbers these are all just county residents or out of county that's 16,000 we don't ask if they're coming we, we haven't been asking are they out of county are they coming from Clemson we are not asking we try to ask if they're a business if they keep coming repetitively uh, we've been kind of doing some studies with it um, the average uh, resident in Oconee County may come to the landfill once or twice a year uh, at most some people don't haven't been to the landfill in over five years and some people don't even know we have a landfill um, so when we look at numbers and we start seeing people who come in once a week and they've got loads of C and D or uh, types of things, you start wondering where they, where they're getting it from. Are they running a business? You question them always oh, coming from my house or my property and you pull up and they've got 40 different tracts of property through the County. So it's kind of hard to get that, put a firm number on whether it's actually residential or if, if it's a commercial customer. Um, but their average load, it, it says 0 0.34 tons or roughly about $10 a, a load. Um, but when you start pulling out uh, the, the number of people who uh, shingle their roof um, every other week um, uh, or have different contractors coming in, um, different people driving different trucks, um, that number actually goes way down. It actually comes down to about 0 0.08 uh, or 0 0.1, uh, which was, would actually give you a cost around the furniture side of about 4 to $5 a, a, a time uh, as for furniture. Um, the yellow, as I was saying, the yellow is actually what the residents are coming in now. Uh, and then also down at bottom is uh, everything we would, we would be accepting for free. Currently that 945 customers who brought yard waste are paying, but we would actually cut that out for contractors since they would be bringing in a recyclable and we would grind it for free. Next slide. The transfer station. Um, last year we had our busiest year we've ever had. Uh, we took in over 43,000 tons. That was actually 4,000 ton more than the previous year. Um, some of that came from um, some a transfer station shutting down in the upstate. Um, another portion of it's come. Uh, the pier opened up a lot more housing over near Clemson, um, and there was a lot more residents coming in, and all that trash in that area. And also the uh, Hartwell Village um, Park opened up, and they, they are bringing a good bit of waste to us now. Um, last year it cost us uh, $1.4 million to get rid of that. That's hauling and trucking over to uh, Homer, Georgia, and that's where all of our waste is hauled from Seneca to the uh, site there at, in Homer. Issues addressed, same thing. Fees assessed on all waste disposed. All recyclables uh, have set at no charge. Fees assessed on mixed loads, and patrons may not be allowed to dispose if waste cannot be properly processed. And that's talking about if they have a lot of concrete or bulky items mixed in with household garbage. Um, this is the way the fees are break down, broke down right now. You notice it's broken up between commercial paying, commercial uh, cities. Uh, the cities are running commercial routes as well. They don't, have, um, they don't no pay. Um, then we have industrial paying and residential paying. Residential paying is coming from uh, either small haulers or also large um, contractors like waste management and public services. Um, the only portion there to, uh, that, that we were looking at we have about, we had 300 and something uh, customers last year came in. They were either bringing TVs or, or larger items that uh, we could, they could not take to the transfer, I mean, to the recycle centers. Um, and it, that they average. Uh, one thing we didn't include on there, everybody in the county has to pay for disposal of cross ties because it's a special waste and we have a special fee that we have to pay <coughs> at the landfill at Homer. Next slide. Um, there was a question asked, um, Mr. Martin asked, uh, said there are some questions wondering why we, uh, we accept recyclables at no charge. Uh, we have three reasons. Um, at the transfer station, um, it reduces our cost that we have to pay to go to um, Homer. Everything we can separate out is um, about $33. We don't have to pay per ton. 
Um, it incentivizes uh, separation of materials at the landfill. Um, the Salt Waste Department, we operate a landfill not as a business, but as uh, by state law, the county is required to offer some sort of uh, means to dispose of some waste uh, or waste disposal. Um, and in the life of the landfill depends on, I mean, if you, you put it in there, it's going to fill up. So as much as we can keep out of there, and the best way you get that is uh, you charge for what's going in and you don't charge for what they keep out. And then increases revenue due to the sale of recyclables. We have some questions on tires. Um, we've always had the impression, I, I've never liked tires. Um, tires, uh, I've never understood why we get uh, as many tires as we do. Um, for me, I buy a set of tires. I leave my set of tires with the person I uh, paid uh, my $2 per tire fee or more. Um, if you go to some site, uh, the state law requires you pay a $2 state disposal fee. And if you notice, a lot of places they'll charge a $2 state fee and then they'll charge another $2 or $4 uh, a waste fee. And then they may charge you for something else to add, extra put them on. Um, last year, we took in 180 tons at our recycle centers. Uh, I think overall is around 300 something ton we actually managed, uh, but we do take uh, some from free if they uh, show proof of documentation. Um, tires that have documentation means they paid a fee for it. Um, you've got cus um, customers like uh, Leader Ford, uh, performance uh, uh, dealerships and different things. They actually pay um, the tire fee into the state and they just bring, us, bring them to us and we accept them at no charge since the state pays us back for those tires anyway. Um, so we've always asked, well, where's the tires coming from? Uh, why are the residents, why does, why does uh, 180 ton equates to about 18,000 tires? Um, so there's 18,000 tires coming from somewhere, which is mainly uh, probably from um, tire shops who are selling used tires. Why move tires to the centers? We, in part of the ordinance, we had asked to move tires from the centers to the MRF. Um, Anderson County did this several years ago. Um, there was a big draw. They, people complained, oh, tires are going to show up on the side of the road, different things, but um, that never occurred, um, no more than what they were already getting. But they were able to start tracking where tires were coming from, and they started realizing it wasn't residents. It was actually tire dealers who were bringing tires to their centers, dropping them off, and the county happened to foot the bill. Uh, so it's better control of them, know where your tires are coming from. Tires that would have documentation. If, they, if a person decided to take some home because they wanted to build a tire swing, and they decided after the fact that they didn't want to uh, put one up, they could bring it to us, show us their receipt, and we would take it at no charge. Um, and the tire program is currently a break-even program. Um, it, what we get money back from the state treasury for tires, and then we also, if whatever we have to pay to dispose of it, any, that extra, if it's overage like it is now, we submit that in our DHEC grant um, at the beginning of the year, uh, and the DHEC grant covers any extra cost. Um, few, uh, in 2016, we had an amnesty program. We had we advertised and allowed customers uh, or anybody in the, uh, in the county, businesses, it didn't matter who. Uh, we had an amnesty program that they could bring us tires for free. Uh, we did it for a six-month period, um, and we actually extended it into um, to the, uh, most of the winter just because a lot of people decided they wanted to wait the winter time because it was a whole lot easier not to have to fight mosquitoes and snakes and uh, even um, vegetation uh, where the tires were located. We had 12 participants uh, that signed up, 3,500 tires were brought in, and most of the tires came from one uh, former business who had stockpiled their tires on their property, um, and they decided they brought them to us, and we accept them no charge. Um, there's a potential for us to do that again. Only The only issue that's come up, uh, I, I talked with uh, our DHEC representative, uh, if, it, if they have a area of a large cleanup, 100 tires or more, they like to know about that because they don't want us to submit something at the end of the year and say, hey, we had this huge overage because we did some kind of program. Um, but if you submit that to DHEC, the DHEC official comes out, he looks at the program, he writes a, a citation type of issue, which basically says that for them to get in contact with the local solid waste director and then work out a way to get those handled and then DHEC would actually pay for those. So we've looked at that, we thought about doing that again, uh, may even potentially do it uh, this upcoming year, uh, if possible, if we can get DHEC to um, sign off on that. Um, the tire, we looked at doing a tire shredder. We actually contacted a DHEC representative in Columbia and asked what, what were the drawbacks we would have faced if we want to get into that operation. There is a lengthy <coughs> DHEC permit that we would have to go through. Um, in order to buy tire shredder, they no longer uh, pay for those in grants. Um, they will not give us a grant for that. 
The last grant they done was for Pickens County about uh, 14 years ago. And then Pickens actually uh, actually sold their shredder because it cost too much to operate. Um, and the one of the, she said one of the largest drawbacks is you have to require a large amount of tires to operate it. You have to have 70 or 80 tons to stockpile at, on site because the machine does 10 to 12 tons an hour and you don't want to just run it for one hour at a time because of the uh, high initial startup cost. Uh, and then once you shred it, that stockpile can catch on fire because it does build up heat. Um, and other issues, it was, uh, there's very, currently very few avenues of getting rid of the product um, due to some of the markets out there. Next slide. And our last slide here, it shows, uh, this is everything for the last uh, four uh, physical years that we have accepted. Uh, I know that's a little, it's, uh, it's kind of broke down how many tons we take in of each of those items, um, the revenue we received off of them, the average price that we are receiving for it. Um, our highest thing is aluminum cans. Um, we love aluminum cans. They're easy to uh, bail, stockpile, and we average anywhere from $1,200 to $1,400 a ton off of those. Um, and then we go all the way through from cardboard. If you notice the cardboard numbers, our cardboard commercial routes actually picked up and uh, some of the push we've had on that on advertising. We've gone from 566 tons in four, uh, fiscal year 15 to uh, over 800 tons in fiscal year 18. We've increased about 300 tons. And last year, the cardboard was up to, had a hit the high of $198 a ton. We were, we were doing good. And then uh, this Chinese market that they put up uh, has dropped prices all the way across the board. This year, we are at a all-time low on a lot of our products from paper all the way across due to the global market. Um, and as of that, uh, any questions? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I've been on the, I've been on the, on the recycling a lot since I've been on here. Yes, sir. And right now we could be staying here, and you get a phone call tomorrow morning that says, "Guess what? We the landfill in Georgia is closed. <laughs> Commode just backed up. We we're going to have to as a county." We're going to have to, I've, I've given out several plans, took my own time on recycling, and, and it just gets pushed to one side. The tires, I even called down to Columbia. Wally Yang is our beloved Chinese representative for the Chinese industry. They, they, they want to get a footprint in the door and put a tire, tire uh, shredder. If you shred the tires, I've said this before, you come up with chunk rubber. Chunk rubber, you put in for a septic tank rather than using gravel. Then you you process again, you get crumb rubber. That's what you put in the road underlayment and for tracks and playgrounds and stuff. Then the last thing you do, you grind it to 400 mesh, you blow it in a boiler. That stuff burns hotter than number six. Santee Cooper can handle it. Um, glass. We could, as a county, we could become the epicenter for glass. You, you pulverize it and sell it for sandblast media. We've talked to the railroad. The railroad said they can reach markets on recyclables that we ordinarily could not reach for truck. Sandblast, ground glass is a media. All the shipyards have gone to it. We started out in shipyards. We used to use uh, sand. Sand caused silicosis. Okay, got rid of the sand. Then, then they come up with coal slag. Mark it under black diamond, black beauty, uh, things like that. Then somebody says, well, there might, there may be mercury in the coal slag. Oh, Lord, we can't use that. So if you all go on the Internet and look, the big deal now is pulverized glass. And that seems to be the answer. And if you go in and look what it costs for a 100-pound bag of that stuff. Now, a shipyard, 100-pound bag ain't nothing. We talk about gondola cars full of, of, of media. So it, it's things that we can look at about the uh, market, the furniture going into the C&D landfill. Uh, when Mr. Mullins here, I said, why don't we, a lot of good, I was out there one time, somebody done dumped a whole mahogany kitchen. It was beautiful. The guy, the Thing that you ought to see before they throw it in. Why don't we pile that stuff to one side? Says, hey, look here, uh, got it burned out of your house. We got all the furniture you need. Now, there's certain things we can't 
do but a lot of good stuff going in there. If we don't uh, get, you said we got seven years left on our landfill right now. All right, what we're going to do when it's filled up? What we're going to do? We pile up uh, going out to uh, McCready. You pat uh, when I go pick up military transfer military stuff. We got Mount Trashmore down there. That's a big mountain on the back side of going into McCready. <coughs> uh, we're going to have to, whether we like it or not, this county is going to have to start looking at recycling. And, it, and it's, but on the on the drawback side, uh, if you people are vindictive, human nature. So you tell them you're going to have to pay for your your garbage. Yeah, like, like I told that I told that uh, what uh, told the laugh with the sheriff the other day. It's it's pure rough time to get a fingerprints off a mattress. Yep. And it, it's not, and I'm not talking down to you. You're doing you're doing a good job. I really, I really admire your job. You know your job, but as a county, we're going to be forced, kicking and screaming, say, okay, suppose Georgia legislature passes. We ain't taking the stuff. We they, suppose they pass e-waste. You know, we got e-waste in South Carolina. Suppose Georgia passed e-waste. No more TV sets or anything else goes in the, in the thing. Then what we going to do with it? We got some hard questions to answer. And it, it's, it's like we keep, well, we'll put it off. We'll put it off. We'll put it off. I gave the plan to Moeller, Scott Moeller. Nothing happened. I've given it out to several people. I even gave it out. I said, look, if you ain't going to use it, darn thing, I'll take it. That's what I do. I'll take it and sell it to somebody else. So um, not talking down to you. You're doing a great job, and you've really expanded your recycling efforts, and you need to be commended for that. And along with all your staff, you got a great staff. Everyone, I don't know. In public office, I get no complaints about any of your staff be grouchy, rude, or otherwise. And that means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think the recycling plan has been put off. It's expensive, and we got to come up with the money. And I think that's one of the I gave, things. I gave, Julian, I gave them private pilot programs. I give them this. I've given that. And but this stuff isn't free. I mean, I, 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 I understand, and I, I think... You know, if you look at the numbers of recycling, I think everything that we've done is is great, and I don't disagree with what you're talking about on the recycling plan. But you have to pay for it. It's not it's not something. But but while I while I agree with what your plan is, I also see the the seven year lifespan of we have to do something. But we can't sit up here and plan and not put money at it and or expect. You know, we have all these projects that we want to do, but nobody wants to pay for them. So that's why they get pushed to the side. Hey, I had 80, I got it down to 85%. The only thing I didn't give Mulder, Scott Muller with the plan was the keys. Because I wasn't going to give the plan, you go shove it, you go shove it to one side, I'll take it, sell it to somebody else with the keys. The glass, the glass, we could become the epicenter because everybody, all the shipyards are having to go to glass blasting. You know how much it costs for the pulverizer? Fifty thousand dollars. Glass, once pulverized, poses no environmental concerns whatsoever. It doesn't absorb water like sand. Goes in a gondola car, and boom, it's off to where wherever they sandblast that. Uh, Bayport, Lockhart. So we. So your proposal is to pay fifty thousand dollars and buy a glass pulverizer. And that would save us money or make us money? It will make it. The plan is to sell. You don't, you're, you're, everything, everything's recyclable. There's some states where you can't bury nothing. It's all recyclable. And there's no reason why, why we can't, we can't do this. It's a, it's an easy fix. So if we're, if we're making, Three thousand dollars on glass recycling right now. You're saying that we would make is that pound bag, is that right? Hundred pound bag of ground glass. So we're making three thousand dollars on glass right now. That's correct. So how would we make back that money if we're only 
How many tons? Between glass. three and four hundred. Between three to four hundred. So, you know how much you know how much media it takes to sandblast one freighter. I'm just saying, where do we get the glass from? We're going to take glass from other counties and stuff. That's the, that's the idea. You charge them to take your glass, and you cut to cut the recyclers cloth. The glass doesn't need to be separated. Green gla brown glass, it all goes in the same pile. Goes through the pulverizer. You pulverize it, load it, load it up. Shipyards aren't going to buy it by the bag. They're going to buy it by the by the hundred tons. It takes. So how are they going to get all the glass here? Huh? How are they going to get the glass here? We got the glass that our counties can bring it to us. You start out with you don't start out with a big splash. You start out with pilot programs. The same as with the tires. The Chinese want a partner. They want to they want to show just like we bought the thing for the rock crusher. That company wants to showcase their 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 crusher. Other other counties, other countries want to get into the grinding business because it's a coming thing. So why aren't we be the showcase? We're showcasing the equipment. Guess what? They're gonna make sure that thing is spiffy clean and running great because they want to sell it to other counties. We can either be on the cutting edge or we can be on the looking edge going to another state looking at how they do it. We got our choice. So you're you're proposing that we do a glass pulverizing plant. Well, you start out. You you got to start out small. You got to you research your markets. Now, but we're making more money on cardboard, yeah. which you know, I mean, uh, you know, like you said, we've advertised it, which has obviously worked. I've had a lot of people talk about that. That's made us. From last year to this year, over six thousand. And if you look back from fifteen to sixteen, um, and I, I've seen a lot of that advertisement that's been out there for that. Plus, what your workers are doing to encourage it as well, and uh, Mr. McCall's efforts on that as well. So I think that, you know, seems to me like you're making a heck of a lot more money in aluminum cans and cardboard than you are in in glass. Maybe we need to focus more on that than. If we're only making, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, yeah. if it's our least recycled hey, what's your, area. And hey, what are you going to do when one day he says, we can't get rid of the glass balls no more, and, so, and Pickens County or some other county comes up and says, we're pulverizing and selling it, and now we're going to charge you a premium price to, to get rid of your glass you. But glass is the smallest portion of all trash that we take in. If you go into the grocery store, besides uh, beer, which is probably the only thing that's keeping the glass industry alive, is probably the largest uh, between that and pickles, is probably <laughs> the two things that keep the glass industry going. So, I mean, you're, you're talking about a, a, a decrease in industry. We better figure out what to do with the plastics because the plastics is what's killing us. Well, the price, well, the price of benchmark crude. What do you think? I, what do you think my primary business is in private? Working on plastics regrinding stuff. That's a big thing. The benchmark price of crude keeps going up. Plastic becomes more valuable because it's oil. One thing, one thing uh, we could do rather than bail it is to chip it. Mm -hmm. Once I've, you chip it. You can either either separate it by by floating it, or or air separation. There are a lot of, there are a lot of things you can do, but just to close your mind up and say, well, the gas, glass ain't worth nothing, and we, it's not worth our while. Sooner or later, George is going to going to put the plug in the commode, and then we're going to say, uh oh, what are we going to do now? And then it's going to be, oh, we need to have a tax increase. We're going to have to hire somebody else. Well. We can either plan for it and say we start small pilot programs. What do you think? What do you think we do in industry? We gonna we gonna start a lineup. We don't go. They ain't gonna throw a bunch of money into. Oh, we gotta go head over heels and then find out it don't work in industry. First time we establish a pilot program. Pilot program works fine. If it don't work, then then we we've lost a teeny bit, but not a whole lot. The glass recycling, the pulverizer. I forgot that rascal handled way up there on the tonnage per hour. Once it's ground, it's not an environmental concern. If it, if it's got the smell of beer in it, I guess the guy running it. Well, he got the shipyard up. 
probably be getting thirsty and smelling the beer. But the glass, the glass is a good media. And at seventeen dollars a bag, the last price I got, that that rascal is expensive. It's just some things we need to do. And I wasn't being closed minded. I was trying to understand where you were going with that because whatever that cost associated with that plan is, no matter how big or small, if I mean the recycling program is going to cost us money, but if it's saving us money rather than you know as all this money up here is all savings to $278,675 goes back to the taxpayers, correct? Yeah. Or saves the taxpayers 278000 Well, you can either either get on the bandwagon or gonna be, he's going to be coming up here again, no offense, but still, and say, guys, Commode just stopped up, and I need five mil tax increase just to, just to try to keep drowning in our own garbage. Or we can say, we go open our eyes and say, we got to look at what other people are doing. Hawaii, look at their recycling rate because they can't bury the stuff. Well, the bandwagon costs money. That's why I was asking you what, you what start, money. Once again, you start out with pilot programs. You can't be, you, you can't. Just keep saying, "Oh, we're going to do this. We're going to go make the big splash." It don't work that way. Well, if you want, if you want to stay successful in industry, it don't work that way. You got, you got to, you got to plan. You got to look at the options. Talk to people. Talk to Yang in Columbia. Talk to other, other, other states what they're doing. State of Florida can't bury the stuff either, because you know why? You dig down four or five feet and use the aquifer. You contaminate the aquifer, and guess what? The next town's wanting to come down and whoop your ass for that. That's serious, because you're going to contaminate all the water. So you start out small, and you, and you see what works. Maybe some things for this county will work. Other things will not work. And we've got we, we to gotta prove it out for ourselves. We've got a lot of good rail service here. We've got a good recycling centers. Got good staff. We can we can start start small and expand. <coughs> Mr. Steele, the other question I had, okay. you talked about seven years, and I know you were talking about an expansion of the existing landfill. Yes, sir. Does this council need to be looking further out than that at what we need to be doing to acquire future land for something like? I mean, obviously constructing a landfill like that is expensive but i'm just well um <clears throat> the the hard drawback now is the the setbacks are so big it's going to be hard to find another place in oconee county um you have to be a thousand foot from your property line um to the boundary of uh, the landfill sale so if uh if you've got um if you want to put in a say a 10 acre sale um, you've almost got to have a uh, a couple square mile area free uh, to get that buffer. Um, right now, if everything goes through, uh, we're, we're looking at a pretty good thing here. Uh, if we can go on top of our landfill, which we should get a determination in a few months, uh, uh, we're looking at probably extending the life from seven years to anywhere from 75 to 100 years because we've got 75 acres we can build on top of. So that's what we're pushing right now. If we can get this thrown through, one of the drawbacks that um, has come up that if they go through is whether or not they require us to put it on a synthetic liner, which is very expensive, but it would still be cheaper than trying to find land and starting from scratch again um, due to how much it would cost. Um, so right now, uh, I would say the answer is no. But if DHEC turns us down, then that answer may be yes, because Pickens County has been in the same boat. They've been extending their landfill out an uh, acre at a time, and they're about full, and they're trying to figure out where their county residents are going to have to haul, where they're going to either have to start hauling it or go into a private facility in Pickens. Mr. Swain? Yes, sir. <clears throat> On these tires, uh, I know a lot, a, a piece of property that has... Uh, let's say at least a hundred tires on it. Yes, sir. How do you, how do you 
get rid of that? I mean, do you? Um, as it depends on what, if it's just regular passenger tires. Well, what we've done in the past um, is we we typically charge a resident if they have just tires dumped on their property, or especially if they dumped them themselves. Uh, we charge them. Um, it used to be a dollar fifty per tire. Uh, we actually went to what the state requires um, states is a hundred fifty dollars per ton. We weigh them in. It's a whole lot easier than have to try to go out and count a, tr a truckload of tires. Um, so we charge $150 a ton to a resident. Now, if they go to DHEC and show that, hey, these tires are dumped on their property, um, they dumped them themselves, or somebody dumped it on them, um, they could come in, um, they'll do an investigation, and then they'll get with the grant department who usually contacts us. We've, um, we've done uh, three major cleanups over the past uh, 10 years. Um, we're, two of the sites had over 20,000 tires. Uh, we just got through the one, what, a year and a half ago, I believe it was down off of 59 um, and they didn't have to, all they had to pay was for um, clearing their property around it to get to the tires. Um, and then the state stepped in and paid for the rest, uh, rest of the disposal cost. So a uh, property with just a few tires, they can either bring them to us, um, especially if it's something they've collected over years, um, we charge for those, or they can, if there's a lot of tires, they can go through the DHEC process, so DHEC could cover the cost of it. Would you like to go look at those tires? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we can, or if you want to have the resident give us a call, uh, we can, we'd be more glad to go out there and take a look and see what they've got. Cause when I was there, it was an abandoned trailer and all the tires. I don't know if there's anyone who lives there. Okay. Any other uh, questions? Mrs. Will, Mr. Still, I want to thank you uh, very good. Say once again, I want to commend your staff at all the centers. You've got a great bunch of guys working for you. And you need to be very proud of those guys. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next thing we're going to have some allow some public comment because some people stayed about the animal control ordinance. Um, I guess fitting will get Mr. Lyles and uh, Shane up here. He was going to he was going to read exactly what was proposed in the ordinance. Mr. McCall, will you explain what, how this process is going to work for those that may not want to speak tonight but may want to speak when we have that? Have it again. They're going to do it, do it again. But just so everybody knows, we're going to have a meeting 5 o'clock, right? Just so. Okay. Anybody that don't know me, my name is Corporal Sean Honey. I'm with the Oconee County Sheriff's Department. Uh, I'm the Director of the Animal Services Division. What I'm hoping to do is clear up some confusion of, from the meeting that was the other night, some of the confusion confusion with the ordinance and the way it was written and the way it was read, uh, and also explain my take from what I'm seeing on my division on how this is going to impact the county and mainly my department. Uh, the first thing I'm going to start with was the, uh, with the shade and the shelter. Uh, I noticed I, I saw the saw the video councilman mentioned in the very beginning that this was not to propose to people's cows, people, people weren't going to bring their cows inside. Uh, the thing with that, we're going to have to be very, very specific that that shade and shelter applies to dogs and not lot, not livestock and not fowl. Uh, that's going to keep a lot of that confusion down, I think. Uh, one of the other things that was talking about trees and shade, uh, a tree, in my opinion, a tree's not going to provide proper shade. Uh, even in the cooler months, when all of us here know, I mean, we, we have 85 degree days in November and December, and all the leaves are gone then. So we're going to, have to work. We're going to, have to work on that and figure out a different way to kind of work that out and make it work. Uh, the cold weather requirements that were, we were talking about, you know, that was read, you know, we're going to be that's going to have to be changed. The cold weather requirements need to be changed because all dogs are not the same. Uh, that should probably be left up to, in my opinion, that should be left up to animal controls officers, officers' discretion. You know, they're experienced. You've got highly trained officers there working. They know the difference when a dog can be, is perfectly comfortable being outside versus one that's uncomfortable being outside. Uh, uh, the, the next one I want to go to is the tethering. Um, I've read over a lot of the other ordinances that are people are proposing tethering. Uh, we're not against tethering. You know, it doesn't, you know, that's, that's one of our things, but we do want it to be done properly. Uh, 
one of the things that I was stressing when I was first reading over the stuff was, you know, they had a, they had a weight limit or a, an age limit. I don't think age limit is going to be really, a pro, really appropriate, uh, you know, to go by. That's another one of those things. Appropriate tether length and weight should be left to the discretion of the officer. You know, that should be a common sense call for any of us. I mean, all of us go to the National Animal Control Academy. We go through different modules to, to be certified to do what we do. You know, any of my officers, myself, should be able to walk out and know that you shouldn't have that small of a dog tied on that large of a chain or whatever. That should be left to an officer's discretion. <coughs> um, One of the other things it had was an uh, age requirement. See, that's another thing. I mean, it sh there shouldn't be an age requirement. It should just be a weight restriction only on that. Uh, part of the problem I had with it was one of the things that, you know, the first time I read it said no dog under six months age should be six months of age should be tied. Well, all right, that sounds good, but when you're talking about a six-month-old Great Dane, you're telling me that I can't tie a five-and-a-half-month-old Great Dane, but you can tie a 10-year-old Chihuahua. Now, that's common sense to all of us, or most anybody. But the age requirement is not a, not a good idea in that. Uh, another thing I'm running into with the tethering is with the campgrounds and everything else. Uh, what a lot of the other counties are doing, the campgrounds, the parks, everything else have all their own policies in place. Ours do not. Ours work off a county ordinance. So that's going to cause a problem there to how we're going to enforce that within the county, within the county parks, because the county park rangers can no longer write tickets or do no longer write tickets. I'm not sure how that works. Uh, but that's another problem we're going to run into with that. Uh, the, the effects that I see it having on us is mainly if, if you go to impose this stuff like this, what we run into, we run into it all the time, is if I come out and I'm fixing to write you a citation for whatever violation I see you're doing, you're, there, you wouldn't believe the amount of people that say, no, you, you're not writing me a ticket here. I'll just, you just take the dog and they send the dog to us. Uh, so it's definitely going to increase, it's going to increase our workload, uh, possibly requiring an additional officer to, to be able to respond to the amount of call volume that this will receive in the summer. This is, we're talking about shade and shelter now. Uh, as of right now, I look back, we have never written a citation for improper tethering or anything like that. We have, we have a cruelty statute in our county ordinances now, also in our state ordinances. We have three certified officers now that can charge at a state level, two, my, two not counting myself. And that's the way we work that. We've actually got three general sessions cases coming up right now that we're pursuing federal charges on. Uh, we can charge at a higher level at a state level than we can off a county ordinance. And if we get out and we deem that it's that bad enough, we're going to get a warrant, we're going to lock you up, and we're going to charge you on, on a felony count. Uh, that's just, that's the way I look at it. We've already got something in place that will allow us to more strictly enforce a tethering violation than with an additional county ordinance. Because with a county ordinance, the worst thing I can do to, do to you is seize your dog and write you a 1,087.50 ticket. On a state level, I can charge you for a felony, and you can, you can look it up to five years. Um, another thing that's going to do is it's going to increase the number of animals that we get in. And everybody that knows us and works with us and has any kind of relationship with us knows that our goal is to get as many out as we can alive. And we saw this year, we've took in more animals this year than I've ever saw come in. And it's, com it's just it's basic math. The more we get coming in, the more we're going to have to put down. And you know, with overcrowding, my superiors will not allow overcrowding. It's not a good idea. We deal with too much sickness, too many animal fights. We, we can't, our, we, we're not the biggest shelter in the world, so we can't handle any overcrowding. So what we try to do is reduce the amount of animals that we get coming in. Um, you know, one of the big things, I mean, for example, I mean, for 2017, we took it, all total for the year 2017, we took in 3,379 animals. For 2018, we've already took in 3,136. I mean, already. Uh, for the months of May, June, and July, and August, I, I've never saw intake numbers that big. May, we took in 475. June, we took in 526. July, we took in 393. And August, we took in 440. Comparable to the year before, in May, we took in 341. June, we took in 390. July, we took in 311. <coughs> and August, we took in 353. I mean, the amount of number, the amount of animals that we're getting, period, this year, has just blown away what we've had in previous years. No idea why, don't know why. We're, we're trying to figure out why, but we, we don't know. Uh, 
but a lot of this is going to cost us to have it's going to it's going to make us have to bring more in people are going to turn animals over to us uh we just, we see it too much i mean for i mean for the year for the year 2017 we were 29 percent euthanasia rate um that is 13 percent dogs and 52 percent cats this year already we're at 34 percent and we've already had to put down or get 38 percent we've already had to put down 17 percent of our dogs and 56 percent of our cats uh, just because we've had so many coming in um, we're not against it at all by any means uh, what i'm afraid is going to happen is one it's going to it's going to increase the volume of animals that we have coming in and it's, that's going to increase the number of animals we have to put down and none of us want to have to do that. that's the worst part of our job i mean by far hands down the worst part of our job uh, Plus the amount of call, the amount of call volume, the, the way the call, volu call volumes are going to increase. For 2017, for six officers, we responded to 2,159 calls. For 2018, with six officers, we've already responded to 2,029. I mean, so we're going to su surpass the call volume we've already had last year. What was that number again? Uh, for which one? This year. 18 is 2029. Uh, you know, I mean, we're. The total animals we euthanized in 2017 was 1,918. 1, we're already at 1,871 this year. Uh, like I said, we're not against it. We th I think it's great, you know, the, the shelter, the shelter and all that. Everybody knows that anybody that with any common sense knows that, you know, we the shelter, the way the shelter is defined with the additions with three sides, a solid top, bottom, and a floor raised where water can't go in. That's perfect. That's great. That's something I can enforce. Um, but you know, with it just specifically with, with it just vaguely saying animals in the, the before reading, you know, Mary Smith down the road can be mad at her neighbor, Billy Jean, and say, Hey, his cows are standing out here in the pasture. They're animals. They don't have shelter. She's got something I've got to enforce. I have to, uh, to where if we change it to where it's specific, where it specifically says dogs. That's something that I can work with. If I, we're not going to get stupid calls on, have to make the whole public mad because we're enforcing laws that, in reality, don't relate to them. Uh, like I said, I think there's some good things in there. Uh, I think ultimately, with the tethering, uh, not so much with the shade and shelter. I think the shade and shelter is a good idea. You know, that's common sense to most of us. Uh, but with the tethering, I think you're going to see our workloads really increase to the point that we may have to we may have to hire additional officers to cover the calls. Uh, plus, you're going to see the number of animals we have to put down go up, uh, just because people, everybody don't care about animals the way some of us do. Uh, you know, if I, a lot of these people, if I'm if I'm going to write them a warning, they'll say, here, just take the dog. I mean, it's it's that irrelevant to them. I mean, the animal doesn't matter, and you know. Unfortunately, a lot of those animals do get put down. You know, we, we, when we're at capacity, we have to do something. Uh, that's pretty much all I've got. We've got a, I don't know. I said, that's, that's pretty much where I'm at with all of it. I think the shade and shelter, I think that's a good idea if we can figure out a way to make it work. Uh, like I said, I'm good with the way, the way, they were, the way that shelter was defined. Uh, but when the shade, when the shade and shelter when we're going for that, we need to make sure that it is very, very, very specific when I'm having to enforce it, that it applies to dogs. I mean, because I mean, because I promise, I mean, I see, I promise if we don't get it to where it says it applies to dogs, I promise somebody will call me and force, try to get me to force somebody to build a raised shelter for a cow or a horse down out in the pasture. It's going to happen, I promise. Uh, and as far as the tether, like I said, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm not against tethering if it's done right. Uh, you know, all dogs, all dogs won't stay in a pen. I, I had one that would, I don't care what kind of pen you put him in, he would tear it up, climb out of it. It didn't matter. And he had to stay on a chain until he died. But he was tethered properly. He had a nice house. He had a 20-foot cable with a run on it. He could go pretty much anywhere he wanted to. And with the tethering, we've already got our state cruelty charges that we can charge if we need to, like I said, which carry a higher penalty than we ever can on a county level. So, I mean, I think, I think what we've got in effect for that is is real good for what we're working with right now uh you know that's just that's me if anybody's got any questions i'm not hard to get a hold of you can just give me a call anytime i'll be happy to answer anything or try to find out anything anybody needs to find out well, i think first off i'm 
appreciate this coming through um, committee and being vetted properly so we can all kind of have an understanding mm -hmm. of where we are rather than it getting slung in front of council and trying to figure it out from there. Oh, so yeah. I definitely appreciate, first off, you know, what you do um, and all of you do for, for this because, you know, dogs dogs are part of our family. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, you know, my, my two are. Um, one of the things with, with Tether, and I'm not want to get too far into betting this mm -hmm. whole thing because I know we'll have a whole day on it, but the biggest thing that I see on tethering is there's nothing about it <clears throat> where I think it should stay unsupervised tethering because yeah. some people see it, say it applies to somebody walking a dog, and if you're walking a dog and it's got a choke or prong collar, as long as it's supervised and humanely done, they are safe aids. Correct. I don't use them, but I know people that do, and I know people that <clears throat> love their dogs that do that, um, and that's just how they, how they do, and it works with their dog. Um, and their dogs treated better than some humans are. Oh, yeah. um, that's one state that I had in there. Um, everything that you stated in there, I, I agree with. Just like you said, we're not talking, which is why I open up that meeting is we're not telling you to bring your cows inside. Yes. Um, you know, the goal of this is, you know, domesticated mm -hmm. dogs is what I would recommend because we're not talking about, you know, coyotes. And I've heard some interesting comments with that as well. Um, but we're, we're talking about common sense protection for our animals and we're talking about things that give us the ability to enforce these rules uh, from a county wide that, but also that exists state wise mm -hmm. and I think that's what you kind of brought up and I would hope that, that our council is also looking at what the state laws are uh, in protection for these animals as well and giving you the tools to enforce um, these laws. I think a few things that that we put in here were were necessary. There was some, you know, concern I had in, you know, adequate, ac um, you know, drinking water permitted at all. I have have to have drinking water at all time. Obviously, water is needed to survive. But you know, if we're talking about 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we nor dogs need that. But they need access to that on regular and proper intervals to ensure proper health, humane care and treatment, which is already in here and already in the state. So I wanted to touch on that as well to ensure that, you know, we, you know, we're, we're using common sense and not wearing you out as well mm -hmm. because y'all have a huge job oh, we do. and you know, what you stated on there and, you know, we're dealing with a very, very small percentage of our population in the mistreatment of animals. But obviously, it wears us out, and it costs us a lot of money to enforce the laws that we have. And just like you said, it's not getting any better. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's I think why we focused on um, the spay and neuter program. <clears throat> and it seems to me we need to enforce um, and, and you know hopefully have something out there with that. So, um, is there a certain Especially cats, it seems like that. Yep. Obviously, the the number of cats is is killing us. The, that's what it is. I mean, if you look, if you look at look at our numbers, if you look at actually our stats, uh, for example, the months that the months that we were so high, uh, you know, May, June, and July, and August of this year, you know, across the board, our dog intake generally stays pretty much the same as our cat intake that fluctuates so much. For example, in the month of May, when we had a 475 total intake, we took in 168 dogs and 288 cats. In June, it was 194 dogs and 330 cats. In July, it was 142 dogs and 240 cats. In August, it was 170 dogs and 264 cats. Uh, it's generally our cats. Our dog, our dog numbers pretty much stay the same across the board. If you look at it four years back till now, they're pretty much they're pretty much average around 170 a month. It's pretty much our average. Um, so our, the majority of our stuff that we deal with as far as our mass numbers that come in is cats. Uh, we have several feral cat populations throughout the county, the, the Mill Hill area, uh, you know, down around Spring Street in Westminster. I mean, they're just, just littered with feral cats. And, uh, and, you know, we work and we trap them, we trap them, we trap them. They've got, they've got several things going on that they were talking about. They used to, I know they used to do a TNR, or a trap, neuter, release. And we've talked about doing that again. And they, they, we're all working on options to try to get that number down as well. 
Uh, we've done very, very, very good on our dog numbers. If you look, if you look from years back, I mean, you know, like right now, I mean, for the year overall, <coughs> right now we're at 38 percent. So out of 3,136 3, 3, animals, we have only had to put down 38 percent of those animals. Uh, you know, we're doing real good as far as our numbers, our in and out numbers go. The majority of our the majority of our euthanasia numbers comes from cats. Um, you know, we've got well, I mean, I'll give you a prime example. Uh, year to date, right now, we've took in 13, 1,386 dogs, and only 17 percent of them have been have been had to be euthanized. We have took in 1,683 cats, and 56 percent of them have had to be euthanized. You know, if you get a cat come in that you just can't handle it. That's not something that we can adopt out. Yeah. But uh, that's the big thing, you know. I mean, we've got, oh, and I said, you know, well, I was talking about our call log. And, you know, like I said, 2017, we responded to 2,159 calls. 2018, we've already responded to 2,029. Uh, my department consists of six officers. It's myself, a vet tech, and four road officers. So the majority of those calls are broke down between four road officers. They handled probably 90% of those calls. Uh, my vet tech and myself, generally the only time we respond to calls is in an emergency, emergency situation or an on-call situation. So that's four people. If our call volume goes up, we're going to have to get more road officers. There's, there's no way around it. Uh, I mean, the four guys I got right now, and I've only got three right now because I've got one at the academy. Uh, I mean, they work themselves to death. I mean, they really do. They work hard. And, you know, the more stuff... And it, it, we don't mind. I mean, we, we work every day. I mean, they, these guys are responding to calls daily, daily, daily. Most times they're eating lunch on the road because they don't have time, they don't have time to sit down. Uh, and, you know, increasing the workload on them, you know, if, if you do it the same four guys, it's going to burn them out. I mean, you know, we're going to figure out some way to lighten the load on them if our, if our, call, if our call volume goes up. Well, and, this problem's very similar to the litter problem it, it yeah. never goes away no it's never going to go away we can walk the walk three miles pick up litter and you turn around and it's already been thrown yep. around behind you and yep. i think that's the and you can turn around and fill up the same amount of bags you just filled up and it's the same way with us i mean it's a never-ending problem uh and i would i don't really know any way to combat it but you know taking care taking care of the animals taking care of my guys are, are, are my main priority and you know right now i mean we're, we're we stay swamped all the time is there a way to do, I guess, you obviously, I, I would think, would have repeat offenders, and maybe they lose an animal or they take an animal or whatever. We do. And uh, do y'all keep track of that as well? We do. Mainly, uh, mainly anytime, we, anytime we seize an animal, we do it for the animal safety. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's being neglected. It's being mistreated. It's not being cared for properly. That's generally the way we seize an animal. Uh, our main repeat offenders that we see are our run at large violation people where they just let their dog run loose and the neighbor complains on whatever. With that, there's really no way we can take the animal. Uh, you know, we can't, a running at large violation is not a seizable offense. All we can do is go out and write them another ticket and go out and write them another ticket and go out and write them another ticket. Uh, with the cruelty, that works out real good and that's where the tethering comes in. With the cruelty, being that it is a state chargeable offense that myself or one of my other certified deputies can charge for, being that we can charge a felony, we don't generally get too many people to do that a couple of times, you know, because I, we will we will literally put you in prison for five years and not bat an eye at it, uh, you know. And that's like that's where our tethering comes in, you know, with with the tethering requirements we've got in place right now. Like I said, if it's severe, that's what I mean. Myself or one of my other two de two certifieds, we'll go get a warrant and we'll lock you up. And we'll charge on state level for however many counts we can, and generally that solves the problem. So. Mr. Martin, will you make sure all council members have a copy of the state animal? Yes, sir, I will. Laws. I know it's probably, I don't know how big that is. But it's chapter 42. 47. 47. Yep, it's chapter 47. That's all I have. If you need, to, if you need to help with that, I'll be glad. Yeah, I can print it all off and drop it off if I need to. I would ask I've you. Got, I, didn't want to direct, I didn't want to direct you to do something. I've so. got. I, I've already got it all sitting on there. I can just bring it and drop my, it off. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, thank you. Thank y'all. All right. Who's next? <laughs> all right.
My name is Aubrey Miller. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of any group. These are just my opinions, representative of myself, a taxpayer. Um, I'm glad I was at the last county council meeting and I'm glad it was deferred. It's a poorly written ordinance and it needs to be revised, specifically the definitions. We need to define the livestock, domesticated. I don't think this is just for dogs, but I, I think you're on the right track. I like the proposed changes, um, but I think we also need to expand upon the roles and responsibilities of the animal control officer. I think we need to expand on the complaint and appeal process and make it clear, because that's the only way it's gonna be effective. Um, you can't, it's a very fine line to have an ordinance written and then try and enforce it. But also as a taxpayer, if I want this service and I want the animals to have a voice, I'm telling you I, I'm willing to pay for it. So if we need to increase fees, if we need to consider licensing, maybe this county's at a point where we're large enough that we need to consider that. Um, I want to thank you for the clarification. Um, I think at the last meeting that wasn't there and there's a lot got very heated. Um, and I just think that allowing people to speak is helpful to let their, their opinions known. Um, other than that, I, I'm just really thankful that you guys are taking the time to address this. Thank you, Pam. Aubrey Miller. Ma'am, if you, you if you have any thoughts or anything, if you jot them down and give them to Katie, and she'll see that we get them. All right, come on up. How y'all doing today? My name is Mark Sandiford. State and uh, Mark, state it in the uh, Mark Sandiford. Um, the last meeting that we had over this. We, you know, I kind of called out the Humane Society, and the lady got up, and she said that, no, we're no part of the American Humane Society and all that. Well, I've got just a little bit of things I want to read to you. It said, uh, this is just headers on this, okay? Let me see. Let me get where I want to be here. It says, uh, what kind of ordinance are right? Outright bans. No unattended tethering allowed. Time restrictions or limits. Restrictions for extreme weather. Uh, below 32, above 85. Restrictions on tethering type, length, and manner. Standards of care regulations. Collar harnesses, types of use, types of tether, environment, food, water, extreme, all that. Okay, enforcement, penalties, know the issues, learn the process, uh, create a coalition, find a friend in office. I don't know which of y'all might be the friend in office. Uh, draft an ordinance. Get a community support. Understand your opposition and compromise if needed. Total ban. Ordinance, uh, Arkansas, total ban, North Carolina. These are samples of ordinances that, they want to, that they're using for this purpose, all these ordinances. Let's see. I'm trying to go through all this. And all these things, examples of sample testimony. You want to read it because we heard it the last time we were here. Okay? They stood up here. They cried. See, the ordinance, the little sample ordinance that they have, almost word for word, almost word for word of the ordinance that you have on your desk right now. It didn't fall out of space and fall on y'all's desk. It came from somewhere. All this that I've got you, sample ordinance, everything that I write, American Humane Society of the United States, 
who they said we had no affiliation, they had no affiliation with whatsoever. Well, how did the same paperwork, the same ordinance, happen to fall on your desk? Now, I understand animal cruelty. We've got laws. We've got yacht laws, and we've got judges who who determine whether you know this guy gets fifty dollars because of his offense, and whether this guy's offense was you know, up to $1,000 and six months in jail or like he was talking about the five years. We have all that covered. Now, I don't know of, of very many organizations and, and, and government, like county governments, that get involved with organizations who clearly have an agenda. And I've asked y'all to look it up. They have an agenda. And why our county is married to someone who has an agenda, helps fund someone that has an agenda. But if we're going to do that, me as the president of the Oconee, the yes, okay, uh, Houndsman Association, we would like a seat at the table. We would like an office at the pound so we can make sure that the hounds that come through there end up where they should be doing what they're bred to do not given to somebody's home where they're going to be locked up inside all day long. So I don't see why, if they can be married with the county, why we can't have our seat at the table so that we can have a voice combating this right down there with them. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Sandifer, if you want any of your stuff too, I know he offered it to them. Yeah, if you I'll want, you can. That's fine. I just want everybody to have the same. Hi, my name is Philip Cheney. I live in Fair Play now. I'm concerned about when I'm walking my dogs and I can't take them into a business and I tether them like a hitching post because they have to stay outside. They can't go in the restaurant. They can't go in the barber shop. They can't go in a lot of the stores because they're not service dogs. I think you need to have a little statement about whether uh, hitching your dog outside of business for a few minutes like people used to do horses is really tethering or not because I can't legally take these animals in the library or any of these other places and if I'm walking my dog in a town I have to leave them outside. I just thought we ought to mention that reality of, of what businesses do in most places around the country unless you have a service dog designation your dog has to stay outside that's all i want to say thank, thank you. you all right is that everybody up everybody okay the next thing is uh we'll, because it's getting late mosquitoes yeah this morning on the news channel seven five o'clock this morning <coughs> they spraying like everything in spartanburg for mosquitoes and this goes back to what we talked about, the tires we must still. We've got a we got an excellent advertiser. I want to commend Mr. Martin and uh, Amanda for putting out a absolutely fantastic news release on mosquitoes. It's very well done, very eye catching. And I and I need to stress to everybody in the county, it's not the mosquito don't care about your gated community. He don't care about your covetousness. He wants to bite you. And West Nile and other other mosquito other, uh, I think it's bacteria they carry. I think um, is, is prevalent. And then they got the uh, down in, down in Florence, and moving up this way is the old super mosquito. I thought I thought somebody's pulling my leg. He said, No, it's real. It's a great big old thing. And it bites like everything. Mosquitoes carry on the wind. You get a big wind blowing, they spread around. They're happy. They move right in. They mingle with their uh, neighbors, fellow mosquitoes. But we need to stress in this county, standing water, that's where they want to be. A bottle cap. You see a little <coughs> bottle cap. Them rascals are just pouring out of that thing. Mosquito, the most of, unfortunately, we need to step up. The bad thing about spraying, it kills the bees, kills the honeybees. That's not good. We need the honeybees. So 
the, is is be, be proactive, get rid of the water, and without the water around, mosquitoes can't live in a branch because it's running water. Can't live in a lake because the fish eat them. So I just want to, I guess what I'm saying is I want to commend Mr. Martin and his staff for an excellent job and uh, just keep up the good work. That's all I say. And the schools are in on this too. And the kids, the kids are going to be the key because you've convinced a kid, he'll worry the daylight side of his parents. Hey, don't, don't leave that stand. There. Turn it over. Turn it over. Pour it out. And it's really good. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, if we're going to have mosquitoes on the agenda, we might as well talk about it. Um, Non-working pools, bigger issue than tires. Exactly. Um, two, twofold in that. Um, people with um, little, little pop-up pools and stuff in non-fenced-in backyards that haven't worked in years are creating more of a harbor for mosquitoes than um, tires are. Absolutely. It seems like we're doing a bigger job on that. Um, as we've moved through code enforcement, what are our rules on non-working pools and pools that have never worked, um, and how are we going to address those? Because um, this weekend alone, it was, you know, what Mr. McCall is stating, and I know everybody's like, well, why are you talking about mosquitoes in, in council meeting? Well, you know, we don't have anything else to do at 7.35 on a Tuesday night. But it is important because just around these houses on Saturday morning when we were picking up garbage, it was an influx of mosquitoes. And I'm not talking a little bit. I'm talking a lot. Um, what is our ordinance state on this stuff? How what What kind of codes can we enforce in these? It'd be a DHEC matter, wouldn't it? Uh, DHEC to a certain extent, but also the IPMC, the Property Maintenance Code. I don't recall it specifically speaking to um, either pop-up pools that are not being used or pools that are just holding water and not functioning. But I know that if it doesn't speak to it specifically, the general you know, prohibition against creating a nuisance outside of your property from activities that are going on inside your property would come into play. Um, I, I don't know our newly appointed code enforcement officer is, is dancing pretty fast to catch up with a number of issues, um, but that's something that we can have him turn his attention to as well. Well, you know, from, from a safety standpoint, we're very, some of these pools are located in high population areas, children areas. Um, the drownings that take place um, around the lake, the more... Uh, I mean, you can get a pool for $200 now, um, and it works great for a year, and it seems like then it just hangs out. But I think, to me, I'd like to see this council, if we're sitting here talking about just the issue of mosquitoes, there's a lot bigger issues that come with the health hazards of something like that and the safety. Um, I'd like to really let us look at that and think about, you know, swimming pool safety uh, moving forward because they're just... They're hanging out there. I know some people say, well, what about trampolines? Well, listen, you know, you're going to break an arm on a trampoline. You're going to drown in a swimming pool. And it doesn't take, I mean, we talk about this about, you know, bathtubs. Well, I'm talking the one pool I looked in, I should have took a picture, but I couldn't. There was some interesting stuff growing in there. So, I mean, what's that, two, three, four years? Um, I don't think anybody lived at the house, so... Uh, I think we really need to get serious about stuff like this because it is a, um, it's, it's, it's horrible. I'll make a point tomorrow to talk with John, our code mm -hmm. enforcement, mm -hmm. and get him to look at the ordinance, see if there's anything in there. If not, we can get back together and get y'all some information on the pools. Okay. One way about swim pool, uh, a box of baking soda will wipe them out. A jug of Clorox will wipe them out. Uh, that's a fast way to get rid of. But people, uh, five gallon buckets, uh, it's everything. Mm -hmm. And what you don't realize, once you get malaria, then you could be taking quinine the rest of your life. 
And when you sweat, you turn your clothes yellow. It's not a very... And I think the two of us up here have been inoculated against all sorts of tropical cocktails, so we ain't, we ain't got to worry about it, but the rest of them do. You leaving me out? You weren't. You were. You I'm were. You, you were drafted. <laughs> got another two-one division up here. Golly, day. <laughs> just a joke. Just an inside joke. Anyway, uh, is that everything we got? Okay. Do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion. We adjourn. All right. We out.